Well, hello there, ladies and gentlemen. Good to see you again, and welcome back to Modern Wealth Management. I'm Ryan Ruff, your moderator, but as always, I'll be joined by Derek Hutchins, the co-founder of Monon Wealth Management. We're going to be diving into another great topic here on the show today, a timely one at that as we approach, yes, another election. We're in an election year here in 2024. Really excited to be getting into a conversation surrounding you know, the intersection, of course, your personal financial world and how it relates to, of course, what's going to be happening in November here. So before we get into the nitty gritty, let's go ahead and say hi to the man of the hour. Derek, good to see you today. How you doing? Hey, I'm doing great, Ryan. Uh, good to see you as well. Happy to be here. Thank you. Yeah. You know, so Derek, uh, the title of today's episode, Vote Your Ballot, Not Your Life Savings. Clever enough, as we do send, you know, tend to be on this show. Uh, it's really, <laughs> you know, that's the backbone of today's conversation. Why don't you frame things up for us? What ultimately are we going to be diving into today? Well, as you mentioned, we have a we have another election coming up and, um, you know, it doesn't seem to matter which side of the political aisle you find yourself. We're all pretty passionate about it. And, um, you know, have you ever heard, Brian, have you ever heard anybody say vote with your pocketbook? I, I think I have a time or two. OK, yeah, <laughs> I've heard that a lot of times and. So what I want to talk about today is um, while that, you know, while that still may be a good saying and there may be places that you can apply that, voting with your portfolio, voting with your retirement savings, voting with your life savings as it relates to repositioning your uh, investments um, may not be the best strategy. Uh, despite that, you know, here we are, you know, first part of March um, of a uh, election year, and it's already coming up. I don't think I've had a review or a client conversation over the course of, you know, maybe the last 45 days that hasn't included. Yeah, Derek, but you know, it is an election year. And with that, what can I expect? So, uh, we had something else on the on the docket today, but I said, hey, we, we've got to get this information out in front of people so that they can at least use uh, use the facts when they're making those, these important decisions. Sure. And then kind of stay in high level, Derek. Why would you say it's just so important, really, to be diving into this today? Because as you mentioned, you're having these conversations. But I know from your experiences, there's kind of a common theme among, you know, your investment portfolio, how you allocate your finances come an election year. So why is this so important then? Well, it's it's important because, you know, the market gives us enough ups and downs and uh, trepidations without us causing, causing harm to ourselves. And, you know, I've been in this business now for, you know, well over 20 years seen a lot of elections come and go and more often than not i've seen people you know passionately make moves that they think are prudent that actually ended up hurting their finances along the way um you know hey i voted for so and so and he didn't win and so therefore i'm going to i'm going to step out of the market the next 4 years uh these are the kind of decisions that i've i've actually seen they have impacted uh, people's finances, and I'd like to uh, like to head it off. Yeah. All right. So, with that being said, Derek, you know, as we typically do on the show, we we break it down complex ideas. We like to break down what are kind of the three big things that you want everybody to to take away from today. And of course, you know, we're going to be diving into those a little deeper. But what are your kind of three three points that we're going to be jumping into? Yeah. So I'm going to start off, and I'm going to give some factual information about market returns and as they relate to the calendar year of an election and then the calendar year that immediately follows the election. Those are the two, um, those are the two time periods that we're all concerned about right now. And so I want to actually go back in history and take a look and uh, share those facts with the audience. The second thing is, is that I want to show you uh, what the investment, what stock market returns have looked like over different presidential terms. We can go back in time and we can say, hey, this guy was my favorite. This guy I didn't like so much, whatever. Um, well, let's let's take a look at the data and let's see 
how it did or did not affect markets. And then the third thing that I really want to uh, that I want to wrap it up with is this this the sense that a stock's price uh, already has some election results already baked into it, along with a whole bunch of other stuff. So I want to I want to talk about that as well. Sure. All right. Well, let's unpack it all. Let's get into that first topic, that idea, Derek, of really looking at election years versus non-election years, how the market performs in these. What do you have for us? Well, I'm going to pull up a slide here for us. And um, this slide talks about the returns both during and after U.S. elections. Now, we have the, you know, because of market data, we have an opportunity to go back to the 1920s to start capturing this. So we go all the way back to a 1928 election, Hoover versus Smith. And we can go all the way through the 1920 election, which obviously was, you know, the, the predecessor to what we're going to see this year, uh, Biden versus Trump. And so what you can see here through the both the green and the dark lines is how the year unfolded as far, regarding the S&P 500. So the way that we track the U.S. stock market. And what you'll notice is, is that the majority of these lines are on the right hand side of the screen. That means that they were, in fact, a positive number. When we add all these up, Ryan, you'll be surprised to know. I mean, we're, you know, we're told that election years are rough. Uh, we're told that the first year of a presidential term is tough. I don't know who came up with that data, but they're not looking at the same stuff I'm looking at. Because when we average all this out, the... Um, the average, the average return of a year subsequent to an election is over 10.5%. Surprisingly enough, the year of the election, it averages over 11.5%. And so what's interesting, Ryan, is that um, both of these numbers are higher than the annualized average of all years combined. So we come into this year full of nerves. You know, we're told that uh, election years aren't great, but that's just not what the data says. It may or may not be great, but average speaking, they actually are on the higher end of, of, of good. Yeah, that's a really interesting chart to see there, Derek. I think it puts a lot of misconceptions to bed for sure. And uh, I'm sure it's some interesting conversations, you know, with clients as you talk through this uh, that you've been experiencing. Um, and kind of Derek shifted now to that, to the second point that you mentioned a moment ago, uh, in terms of, uh, re looking at the numbers, what they show, depending on who wins the election, you know, whether it's a you know, Republican candidate or a democratic candidate, what do you see? What do the numbers tell us uh, with regard to this and why should people, uh, care really, uh, you know, with regard? Well, they should care because information influences our behavior. That's why. Um, anybody that knows me knows, uh, that I do have some pretty strong political opinions. Um, you know, statistically speaking about half the population agrees with me and about half the population disagrees with me. And so when you think of it in that terms, you know, eventually, you know, we will get this 2020, 2024 election behind us. And when we do, half the population is going to be very happy and the other half, not so much. Well, <clears throat> that's fine. You can carry those feelings home with you and, and deal with them. But what I don't want that to do is to influence your perspective on markets. Again, we can go back all the way to 1928 and look at different presidential terms, both Democrat and Republicans. And you can go back through, and I have it pulled up here on the chart. It says annualized returns during U.S. presidential terms. And when you take a look at this, I want you to go through and pick out the people that you like and the people that maybe you disagreed with. And then look at the returns that they 
that, that, that really were produced under their watch as president. And so you go back through here and you can see the majority of them, the vast majority of them were positive. Matter of fact, I can only list a couple, uh, actually three presidents that while they were in office during that term, that the market finished, the stock market finished lower than where they began. You know, the first one was President Hoover. He was in office from 1929 through 1932. Ryan, let me ask you, was there anything going on in the world that <laughs> may have impacted stock market returns in the late 20s and early 30s other than President Hoover? Just a little thing called the Great Depression, Derek. That's right. So <laughs> it was, in fact, the Great Depression. Highly publicized, multi, you know, multitude of different reasons as to why that happened. And, you know, I am a student of history. I don't know anyone who solely blames President Hoover for the Great Depression. Yet, under his watch, well, we saw the worst stock market that, that we have, you know, in history. You go up a little bit further and you can see now we've got a blue bar. So, you know, uh, this, is, this would be for the other camp. And you see... Uh, President Roosevelt. So there's, it's, it's difficult to find people who, um, who don't like President Roosevelt. Yet in that term between 1937 and 1940, again, we had a negative stock market return. Now we have to go in order to get back to, you know, to the next one, we have to go all the way back up to 2001. And, uh, Poor old George W., whether you like him or not, he, he didn't have a successful run. Between 2001 and 2004, his first term, we were negative. And then again, his second term, 2005 through 2008, we were negative. Now, let's think through, let's think through this. Now, I, full disclosure, I am not a huge fan of George W., Okay, I am a Republican, but of all the of all the Republicans that I voted for, I probably view him as my one of my least favorites. Maybe that was because of the economy that we lived through over that time period. But but let's think about what actually happened. He came into office in 2001 and we were right in the middle of something that's now called the tech bust. Ryan, do you think George W., do you think he caused the tech bust? Now, I can't imagine uh, George W. had much to do with what was going on in Silicon Valley and the northwest of the Pacific. He did not. He did not. And then you think about where he ended his presidential term, mm -hmm. 2008. We had a little situation going then, too, Yeah. Called we now call the financial crisis. Mm -hmm. Once again, lots of different things led to the financial crisis. I've never heard of anybody solely blaming George W. Bush for that catastrophe. So here's a guy that, uh, you know, stock market would, would view him as unsuccessful. Yet you had, he started off in the tech bust, concluded with the financial crisis and then had a little thing uh, called 9-11 someplace in between. Okay, so very rough, very rough run that he had. And certainly it is indicated in into his stock market returns. I go right in front of him and you see uh, Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton, uh, the stock market had a heck of a run over his time frame. But uh, two very successful terms as far as stock markets were concerned. Uh, from 1993 until uh, 2000. Now, what caused that? Well, whether you like Clinton or not, I doubt anyone listening to this believes that his vice president created the internet. And, and I, I hope everybody got kind of a laugh out of that because Al Gore did in fact uh, catch a little flack for, I don't know if he, mentioned that he, you know, started the internet or what, but they didn't, uh, between two, uh, between, you know, between 1993 and 2000, 
we had that great technology boom with really the implications of the internet coming to the masses. And we, as we all know, that's changing all of our lives. It has changed all of our lives as we continue to use it right here today as we're talking. So I think that when you take a look at this chart, you should go through and just, you know, maybe pick out some people that, that you, did, you don't think did a great job and see how did the stock market actually react to their presidency. And then think about all the other things that were going on over that time frame. My guess is, is that the presidency had little to nothing to do with the overall stock market return. Appreciate you walking us through that again, just kind of putting, you know, some of these misconceptions to bed. Derek, the third thing you wanted to mention uh, today was surrounding the securities themselves, you know, within your investment portfolio and how those reflect, you know, differently or even the same with regard to an election year. So talk to me a little bit about this and uh, and what it really means for your investment portfolio specifically. Yeah. Okay. So I think, you know, this, this can have multitude of uh, implications and you can think about this through some a couple of different lenses today we're going to talk about we're, we're here to talk about um, elections and the way that politicians affect stock pricing and what I want you to know and I've got a chart up here is that a stock's current price includes all public information regarding the economy the world economy and that company, you know, specifically. So, you know, today we have um, uh, NVIDIA seems to go up every single day. Uh, Eli Lilly here in my hometown seems to go up every single day. And, um, and so when people call and they ask about that, or they want to now get in and say, oh, but Derek, you don't understand how fast they're growing uh, their business, or you don't understand how good this new drug is. Well, what I've got to say to that person then is, in order for you to buy today and assume the same kind of momentum, the same kind of growth, you have to believe that you know more than anybody else about this particular company. You know, as it relates to NVIDIA, well, I think everybody understands the impact that uh, their chips are having on the AI, you know, this AI technology. Uh, As it relates to Eli Lilly, I mean, at this point, who doesn't know that they have a weight loss drug that is, is coming out and that it's gonna be a big winner? We already know this. Um, it is, you know, those, it, it's already baked into the price. That's why it has gone up the way that it has. Those same thing, those same, that same kind of thinking gravitates down towards macroeconomic data, uh, CEO changes, uh, research and development, R&D, R&D pipelines. All of this is considered public news. And certainly the fact that we have kind of a 50-50 chance of either getting uh, President Biden or President Trump heading into next year, that is currently baked into the price. If it was certain one way or the other, you might see the odds change. But the political environment and who will be the president and who uh, will control Congress. That that kind of stuff, Ryan, is already baked into the price because it is public information. We know what the odds are. We know what um, you know. We know how this thing plays out. So what I would say is is that you know, if you're nervous about the stock market, I just because of the election coming up, I want you to know that that nervousness that you're feeling is already baked into the current price. Really an interesting consideration there, Derek. Thanks for, for shedding some light on it. And Derek, I know uh, you have had, well, you have an interesting story you want to share with the audience regarding two specific clients 
that had very different political beliefs, yet found themselves in similar waters, if you will. Share that story with our audience because I think there's a lot to gain from it. All right. So, yeah, I do. And it's, it's you know, this it's so interesting right now because we're going, um, you know, we had a, a, 26 ele- a 2016 election, which we know Trump won, and a 2020 election, which we know Biden won. And what we also know is that one of those two is also going to win this year. I don't know which one, but one of them. So if I go back to 2016 and I think about Donald Trump winning, uh, again, half the population was pretty excited about it and half not at all. Well, one of those, um, one of those people who were probably left-leaning and very, very concerned about a Donald Trump presidency walked into my office the day after the 2016 election. He's a very smart person. But on that particular day, he said, sell everything, Derek. You have no idea how bad this is going to get. And um, of course, I didn't just do it. I, I talked with him and I tried to reason with him and I showed him the, uh, the data uh, from previous election results and so forth. But it was to no avail because... At the conclusion of our meeting, we did, in fact, sell his portfolio and move it into cash upon his wishes. He was convinced that the economy was going to fall and therefore stocks were going to go down with it. What we know now is, um, is that that's not what happened. And so I pull up on my screen. Um, I actually I pulled up the day that my client walked in. He walked in on November 9th, 2016. And he got completely out of the stock market. And it wasn't until January of 2018, over a year later, that he agreed to get back in. Unfortunately, Ryan, at that point, the market was up more than 30%. So he was, in fact, buying the exact things he sold 14 months earlier at a 30% increase in cost. Mm. And I hate that story, uh, but I feel like I've got to tell it so that it doesn't happen again. Yeah. We fast forward now to 2020. And um, in November of 2020, uh, The day after election day, it was November 4th, 2020, Um, Biden had been announced the winner and a dear friend of mine and client gave me a call and said, get me out. Uh, I'm just going to sidestep the next four years. Uh, The economy is going to tank. I don't like his policies, you know, whatever. Basically, the exact same story that I heard back in 2016, just regarding a different candidate. Again, I wasn't very good at persuading him to stay the course. And unfortunately, he did step out. He didn't step back into the market until December of 2021. Again, though, at more than 30% increase in price on the exact same investments that he had sold a year earlier. So different candidate, four years later, different political party, exact same mistake. It's tough. It's tough to, it's tough to see, tough to hear. Uh, but boy, is it illuminating to back up, you know, some of the, the charts and graphs you showed us earlier, uh, really solidifying the argument that there's a, there's a lot more to be gained by just stick it, stay in the course. And that, and that follows kind of a theme of a, of a prior episode we had on this show, Derek, surrounding just, you know, managing your investments during tumultuous times. I mean, it's you get, staying the course, is a big theme here. I know. L- listen, I think most of the people that would ever watch a show like this are probably pretty intelligent. They've heard the stay the course thing before. Mm-hmm. Um, History, history up to this point has proven that that's been a pretty good uh, strategy to live with. Yet, our emotions get involved, and we always say, 
yeah, but this time is different. This time it's really going to make an impact. This, uh, how many times, Ryan, have you heard, this is the most important election? I'm 46 years old, and I think every election for 46 years has been the most important election of all time. So, um, listen, uh, at the end of the day, um, you know, I've got, you know, some takeaways, you know, from this, you know, first and first and foremost, um, who's in office is certainly important. Again, I, you know, I, I'm passionate about the political environment. I certainly have my own feelings on how things should be. And I want to encourage everybody to vote, to get engaged, to do their part. But with that said, whoever wins, don't let it disrupt, disrupt your investment plan and your financial future by then taking the next step of making an investment mistake just because your candidate did not win. And that's why we say vote with your ballot, not with your life savings. No, couldn't have said it better my, myself there, Derek. Uh, Derek, for, you've had a lot of these conversations, especially this year with clients of yours surrounding their feelings, political wise, and then of course, you know, financially speaking. Uh, for anybody out there that's maybe chewing on a piece of information that you shared today, they'd like to talk a little bit more about it with you, or maybe they just want to set up some time to just talk about any element really of their financial world. What would be the best way they could reach out to you and your team and just start that dialogue? Our website's the best, uh, mononwealth.com, uh, www.mononwealth.com. It has, um, it, you know, just about all the information that we put out, we also uh, publicize right there on our website. It's also got a link in there that allows for you to contact me. And that's an opportunity for you to click on the link, request, uh, request a phone conversation, request to come in the office and talk with either me or one of my associates regarding your situation. If you're not ready to take that step, um, the material that I, I based kind of this, these stats and this conversation on has been put together in a white paper that we can also send to you. It's called the market and U.S. presidential elections, something that I think is really timely. So if you just uh, head over to mononwealth.com, hit the contact us page, tell us what you would like. We would be happy to correspond with you. Awesome. Well, Derek, thanks so much. I appreciate you carving some time out of your busy schedule, but uh, I know you got clients to serve, so we'll let you get back to doing that. But uh, I'll see you on the next one. All right. Thank you. Of course. And hey, folks, as always, we're going to take a final beat here and thank you guys for stopping by and spending time with us on the podcast today. If you learned a thing or two, we sparked some interest. Uh, maybe we're invoking some action from you. Great. But also we want to make sure that you subscribe to the show on whichever platform you checked us out on today so that you don't miss out on future conversations like this, where Derek and I unpack these different wealth management conversations. You know, sometimes it's strategies and solutions themselves. Sometimes it's more holistic thinking like today's episode, but either way, we want to have these conversations so that you and yours come out better for it on the other side. Before Derek, I'm Ryan. We're going to go ahead and say so long, but we appreciate you stopping by and being with us on Modern Wealth Management.